Thanks, James. I think I've known James for 20 years, 22 years or something. I was trying to work it out. When I was a part one and James was a part two and he corrupted me. Um, I thought it was a school of architecture. I'd, I'd talk about um, being an architect, unsurprisingly, because it's actually really quite hard. Um, and as James has just suggested, I'd quite like to talk about um, our studio processes and the, the kind of some background to our work. I think in some ways what we've completed is perhaps the less important bit, I feel. You know, those are the products of our process. And actually as students, I also teach, um, it kind of frustrates me when a student brings me an image and they don't interrogate the process behind that image. They don't understand the decisions and they don't really understand how the architect got there, which is the thing, that's the thing that you're learning. You're not learning about how to make a really great image for Instagram or a magazine. Um, so it's called everything all at once because that's what it feels like. I know you're building up to a point in the year where you think it's getting stressful. It just carries on getting worse and worse and worse. Um, and everything kind of accumulates and, it, you know, as a profession, you're an urban designer, you're, you're incredibly, incredibly responsible in terms of using people's money, you're a sociologist, you act politically, um, and I hope also you're an optimist. And that's before you've, that's just kind of your character, that's before you've actually even started to think about a project. And then imagine you might have 30 projects, not just the one project, you're in such a kind of nice spot. Um, so we are called 3144, a bit of housework. Um, we were completely unplanned. It was an accident. Um, so we didn't, we didn't all meet at university and think, right, one day we will have a project and we'll go on to kind of great glory. And in many ways, we didn't really, I don't think I, any of us as individuals had a desire to actually be a sole practitioner. But this is where I blame James again. Uh, James had left to come and work at UWE, and I was at Proctor and Matthews thinking, oh, you've left me behind, you've left me here. Um, and James rang me up and said, some of my friends have got too much work, you should go and kind of work with them, you should go and see what it's like on the outside. So I did that, and then what happened was um, I started to get my own work. So, uh, and this was probably, this, this house was a, like a little bit of therapy. I suppose, because I'd worked for such a long while at Proctor and Matthews, you have to kind of re-find what you're interested in personally as an architect. And I started to get a little bit more busy, and it was mainly domestic work. And then one of my friends, who was also at Proctor and Matthews, he um, ended up meeting somebody Dutch, moved to Amsterdam, and we kept in touch, and he was underworked, should we say? It was 2007. So I started to kind of just feed him bits of work that I couldn't quite manage to do. And we suddenly thought, well, we could, we could, I suppose, set up a practice and I would be full time. James would be kind of part time. Um, and we kind of, we like this idea that there might be somebody in Amsterdam and somebody in London and that there's always been this kind of history of um, kind of architectural cultural interchange. We stole the townhouse. So, um, you know, that, that was a kind of Dutch invention, the long, tall, narrow, thin plot. We reappropriated it. Uh, the drawing on the right is the kind of the, the budget, the medium and the luxury. If you're in the Netherlands, if you're a little bit flash, you still are referred to as having it wide, which means that you could afford a wide plot and a wide townhouse. And that led to us kind of forming a name that was about place. So 31 is uh, the Netherlands area code and 44 is the UK area code. We'd worked at a place which felt like a law firm sometimes because it was named after people and you would turn as a kind of a bit of middle management you'd turn up at a meeting and you could tell sometimes your clients thought well you're not you're not a named partner so we wanted something that was a lot more kind of empowering for everybody that would work with us and it also means that you don't have to go to all the meetings you can kind of stay in the office and hide meanwhile the third partner was building this house he was also still at Proctor and Matthews he built a house in his spare time. He's quite driven. Um, and we realised that we had kind of complementary skills, that I probably was most interested in the kind of cultural direction of the practice. James is um, annoyingly smiley and nice and people, he kind of charms people. And then Steve is unbelievably rigorous. So we kind of thought, well, actually, we, could, we would actually be quite a good kind of partnership. So our kind of roles cross over, um, but we, we, talk, we all talk about everything. And, um, but we each take a kind of responsibility. And I think that's quite 
key in our personalities. We don't actually fight over different aspects of the practice. You sort of think, okay, if you think this is wise, then we'll do that. And if you think this is the right design, then we'll go with that. Uh, we're now 10 of us, um, which makes me tense when I picture the spreadsheet of overheads and what we must invoice every week. Um, and I guess what we've tried to do is we... James used to keep me there until 10 in the evening, drawing a window schedule by hand. And we thought, there must be a nice way that you can actually make good buildings without bad lives, James. Um, so we try hard not to rely upon long hours, and of course that doesn't always work. We try and make sure that um, our colleagues or our friends, so we recruit quite slowly and quite carefully. Um, and we have a kind of culture, a culture of a very open table, so that very scruffy table. On the right hand side, it, everybody is kind of welcome. Um, and I think partly I'm not a strong decision, a confident decision maker, so I kind of enjoy that fact that you, we, we recruit good people, so why would we not talk about everything and anything with them? And crucially, we teach. And I think that is, that's kind of been incredibly formative in how um, our practice works and runs. And I'll kind of get back to that and it's reached that nice point where now we take our students on a trip and it becomes an office trip as well so the office comes with us. Um, I wanted to talk about clients because we've got some quite diverse clients um, and it's incredibly demanding so we have people that give us a huge amount of responsibility and just say right here's a site go on and get on with it a kind of um, accidental developer as we've referred to them we have a client who is obsessed by the spreadsheet and the return and we just have to get planning in the minimum period and we have to kind of meet meet targets and then in some ways we have a kind of architectural patron on one of our projects but i think without really good strong clients then you can't actually make a good project you can make the best of it but you you don't get to the end and feel sometimes you feel like you've kind of cornered somebody and that actually isn't very satisfying so we have a quiet Londoner, and he came to us um, because he used to walk his dog past Steve's first house. So clients arrive by stealth. Um, and then he saw that same house in The Guardian at the weekend, so he just rang us up. And he had retired about 20 years ago and bought, started to buy garage sites, just because he thought it was a good pension, £10 a week from each garage. And then he'd suddenly started to realise that he was actually sitting on a collection of building plots, um, which were worth much more than £10 a week. Um, and he's completely hands-off. So it's, as an architect, we have to kind of make commercial development decisions. And he, he was some of the, I'm going to show you one of the houses, I think, two of the houses. We've done eight houses for him. Two are built and four are about to start on site. But... We literally have to kind of Google house prices in different areas of London and think, how much can we push this? We can't overspend. We have to get the, the kitchen from Ikea and, and pimp it with nice doors. We can't go to Bulltout just because we're vain architects. So it's, it's a big responsibility. We have a, um, a client whose office is pretty much, well, just left of centre of that image. So he's full, full New York. Um, which is a very different experience. He arrives sometimes on his own with just a pilot. So he travels quite nicely if he's in a hurry. Um, it's, it's a different world. He's promised us a house in Colorado. That's yet to happen, but we have much bigger projects with him and he, he has a much different interest, but he obviously doesn't understand the UK system. So much of our role is actually, he always buys very difficult buildings as well in conservation areas. So it's actually about how we kind of steer him through that process. Um, and I've no idea how he found us. We got a phone call from a kind of property agent. He said, can you meet this guy next week at the Barclay Hotel? So I thought, okay, this is nice. Um, and we had a kind of 30-minute discussion about a site that he showed us at the beginning of the meeting in, in a really nice spot in Shoreditch on Redchurch Street. It felt like an hour. Um, very intense. And he just finished the meeting and said, I like you guys. You're authentic, but you don't oversell. And that was it. And he was like, you don't get feedback very often. I was like, no, no, we don't. We're British. But um, <laughs> the, the accidental developer, the New York guy, and this third one have kind of changed the trajectory of our practice. Um, this is not the client. Um, but we have a, a client who's a History of Art graduate. He's a developer. But he's um, 
very into architecture. He's very articulate and he's willing to invest in architecture within the constraints of... He's a very intelligent man, so he's a developer. Um, and when we were at Proctor and Matthews and the phone used to ring, Steve and Andrew, Proctor and Matthews, used to occasionally say, quick, it's Lord Palumbo. Because I guess in the 90s, um, that might have been your ultimate architectural patron. So this is Lord Peter Palumbo, commissioned Mies, obviously, famously, for the site on Bank. Then he commissioned James Sterling. He used to own the Farnsworth House. He had an apartment by Le Corbusier in Paris and, a, and also a Frank Lloyd Wright House. So this is our kind of fantasy architectural patron. As a practice, we teach at Kingston School of Architecture. I teach with a colleague called Kate. Um, and it has, I think it's it sort of transformed the culture of our practice. I think I was probably working for only three or four years and I kind of started to, it's, it's amazing how quickly you can kind of settle into being perhaps slightly formulaic. Um, and I feel that as a tutor, I'm just desperately worried that you all go and look at our website and if our work doesn't match up to what we're trying to teach you, then you're kind of going to judge us. So it's, it's a real discipline and actually you have to be incredibly articulate. You ex have to explain enormously complicated things about cities or plumbing, you know, these kind of incredibly diverse things. And it's, it's really helped the kind of the culture of our practice on lots of different levels. So I'm going to very quickly talk about our teaching. Um, as we teach as a practice, we thought, uh, this is for third year, we thought we would actually use a live project as a kind of um, starting point for that. And we, uh, we set a project called the Deep City. And the idea was that in a city there are kind of depth at all, all scales, so from the kind of city figure of a building at great distance to the depth of a window reveal. Those, all of those things have a very significant impact. So we've set projects that kind of try and pick up on all of those different city depths everything all at once, I suppose. Um, so we, we, we're working on a building on the right-hand side of this block. It's in central east London, and then the, the other three labels are, are different sites. And we try to reimagine our idealised block. We're in Whitechapel, sort of Whitechapel against Aldgate. The Cass has famously kind of been bought out, sort of pound signs pushed them out, and Barclays or Barrett's or somebody bought their building. Um, so we were kind of a little bit sad about that. And then historically on, on this very block was the beginning of the, the Salvation Army. And we sort of thought, well, what, what's kind of, if we were to remake an idealised block, what could we scoop up that Whitechapel has lost? So we, we've got a kind of meeting hall and a library, um, a new art school. And then because we wanted to keep it super real for them, we've got an office building, but a kind of creative studio space, which is exactly what Tower Hamlets want on planning policy. So we thought we'd keep it super dry. Um, and the block, the block's kind of perforate, so the, the, the right-hand side that you can see a gap on, um, we, that's our project, we will actually be kind of containing the block, and I, I think we're a little bit sad that London has kind of got less perforate, that um, big, the bigger developers accumulate sites and they make kind of mega blocks that you can't get through, so we like this kind of more loose... Um, kind of medieval model of London. So we got them to study lots of perforate blocks in, these are in Ghent, Amsterdam and London. Some of them are, The Economist is the obvious one, the tall one at the back, uh, Middle Temple on the bottom right, bottom left is the Beguinage in Amsterdam. Um, to kind of look at the scale of those spaces very quickly and very simply, and then we got to draw them in the most solid kind of projection or representation that we could imagine. So they're kind of think, thinking at the scale of a city block. Imagine these are all things that you get bashed to kind of keep doing as well. And at the same time, we got them to think about the relationship of a room to the street, so a space within that city block. So those are all models on the left, but they're models that are only made to produce the image on the right. So they actually took, in groups, they took Peter de Hook paintings and turned them, exploded them from kind of two-dimensional paintings into a three-dimensional understanding of the depth of a space. And uh, we quite like the sort of symmetry that as, as architects you're going to give builders a bunch of two-dimensional things and you're going to ex expect them to make this kind of most amazing three-dimensional edifice concoction. We get them to model in great detail precedent buildings so that they're looking at kind of micro depths of facades. So uh, Jan de Wilde, Brother, a sort of Parisian practice, ONO, a Belgian practice, and then 
Caruso, St. John on the right. And each brief, each kind of research brief, is then matched with a proposal brief so that they, we try and get people to understand that why they're doing this weird bit of research that we've set them and then they have a kind of piece, a proposal which we should run, run alongside that. And because it's, we are a teaching practice and we're trying to teach how we practice, um, we, make, we made the models on the left, um, which I guess were our kind of version of, of that. And then these are all student proposals on the right. They're currently quite anxious. I'm seeing them tomorrow. Um, oh, blimey. Uh, we don't really know where we're going, so I thought I should kind of state that, because there's no grand plan. And then, I just like this. Um, I, 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 we don't see this as our future. A kind of proud architect on a 20-story plinth of his own making, looking across a city that you know, he kind of l partly remade. Um, if you're not good at recognising grumpy old men, that's Mies van der Rohe in Chicago. Um, so to talk a little bit about our values. So that, I suppose that was all the kind of culture of our practice and how we try and work. I think um, all three partners, we're all from the countryside. And I think that makes us slightly in awe or deeply kind of respectful of the city, or the idea and then the reality of the city. And I, I see it in the countryside too, that you know, one, one of my oldest friends has a, a large farm and he carefully manages that landscape for future generations. And I think that, that's the kind of sense that we have as an architect, that in many cities there's at least a thousand years of having a go at making a city. And that is the most enormous kind of collective endeavour uh, that you must kind of set out there and participate in. And that to kind of do that well, I'm not sure, we try to make sure that we're not, we don't act individually. We're not interested in producing a building which is just about us. We're interested in producing buildings which are very much about the city. And that's at many scales. So cities wear time in the most kind of lovely way. So we, I'll get to it, but we, I kind of obsessively take weird photos of just things that we've found. Um, and I just really like this, this kind of expression, even in a small detail, such as a street sign, that it kind of wears time in a very, very obvious way. So time is important to us. Um, we are, try to make work which is defined by its sense of belonging um, and not belonging to a very particular, particular era. So I suppose in some ways we're a little bit anti-fashion, um, or at least this is the sort of high moral ground that we try and set ourselves. We're not, very, we're not into the idea of novelty and kind of needless innovation. And I think that just the, by definition, if you're, the word novelty, as soon as you put something out there, it's gone. If the only thing that your building has is it's a, it has a, a novel element of surprise, as soon as that moment has gone, then you've, you've lost the value of your building. Um, this, we recently went to, I think I've said again, Amsterdam, Belgium, with our students and our office. And I really, I didn't get this building actually at all from, from photographs. It's Ghent Market Hall by Mary Yose van Hey and Robert and Darm. Uh, and I'm just putting it in there as a, as a precedent, I guess, that for us really works in terms of its sense of belonging. Ghent's a city of kind of eccentric gables and you kind of glimpse this building um, clearly made of these kind of two different gables. But actually when you go around the corner, it's incredibly bold. And when you first look at it, you can't quite believe that they've got away with it. But when you start to kind of draw a plan of it, it subdivides a really amorphous, weird public sp space very cleverly and then creates this kind of public room, this market hall beneath it. And there's a kind of giant outdoor fireplace hidden in one of the legs. It's a very sophisticated building. Um, there, I told you we were dull. So this is one of ours. And again, it's, it's a, we're quite comfortable, I suppose, that we might be part of the background at times. Um, but, and this, this sense that it, we, we try and judge our buildings by sort of thinking, in 50 years time, if we looked back, would we understand where it was from? Or would we, uh, we're kind of more keen that it would actually be slightly ambiguous about its age. I will not be here in 50 years' time. It's too stressful. Um, so this, 
sense of the belonging, but we are still then keen to make a kind of contribution to the city. So we start off trying to think, well, our buildings should be comfortable about being part of the background of a city. So if you're on a bus or a pedestrian, you might just walk past them. We, you don't have to have a building that's shouting at you at all moments, but still, you know, we're architects. We want people to enjoy what we do, just as it's kind of built into us through being in a university like this. So um, we still want them to be able to kind of come to the foreground when you actually notice them. So this is, um, this is the building that we did for the New York spreadsheet guy. This is the first one that we did. Um, which from, I think from this angle, we, it's in a conservation area, so we played with this kind of slightly um, fruity kind of modelled Victorian facade. And then the facade changes a little as it goes around the corner. But I think that, for us, that's kind of relatively background. But when you move around the corner, it, it, I'll show you it in more detail a little bit more detail later, it re-articulates that corner. Um, so we kind of hope that the buildings are kind of quietly confident and they're assertive, but they're not brash, I suppose, to use regular terms. And personality is important. So we think that um, buildings which have some level of personal personality actually begin to kind of enrich a city. This is wild. Um, this is Lutchen's 1930 in Pimlico in London. And uh, I've kind of never really understood it, but I've always really, really liked it. And I think architects, well, who doesn't love Lutchen's? But this was the first bit of mass housing that he did. Um, so he kind of took a strategy that tried to break down the mass, but at the same time it, it let all of these apartments with their individ individual windows get kind of stitched together in, into a kind of cohesive whole. Uh, by the placing of those white, white blocks. Um, so it, it's quite abstract. It's, I feel, quite timeless. It could almost, in slightly different materials, it could almost be just some large kind of Dutch mega housing project. But it also really speaks of its location. So it's in a bit of London, which is most of London, half of Britain, um, of this age, made of bricks and white stucco. So it's kind of born out of its place, but it's, in, it's incredible the level of personality it has. Uh, and another thing from our weird collection, my favourite fire alarm. Those aren't words I never thought I'd say. Um, so even the most mundane things can actually be given personality. That's just off Oxford Street. Um, and a, a relatively mundane piece of suburbia that we were trying to give personality to, I suppose, or get on to that, that house. So I thought I'd briefly talk about where our ideas come from. So, and I think this, you know, we don't do anything that other architects don't do. So as an architect, you kind of collect images and knowledge and you start at university and you go, you travel a lot because architects love seeing other cities. You take loads of photographs. There's that point where your photographs transition from being of your friends or your family to actually being of rusty doorways and bits of city and you get back from a holiday and your wife looks at it and it's like, it's none of us, how rude. Um, so we have thousands of these. Um, <laughs> some of them are quite frightening. So a trip to the Netherlands in the 1990s. So he was weird back then too. Um, and then across the top, of course, you know, all architects, there's the big superstars, I suppose, 20th century heroes, all of them tyrants, I think, actually. I don't know why Louis Kahn's not on there. I drove halfway across America trying to find some Louis Kahn. Um, but things like the peg, I really enjoy the fact that the, that peg, it's actually by a Kingston graduate from a few years ago, is reduced down to its kind of elements of a, a hinge at its simplest and the rubber band obviously making it function. What else is on there? Venice, New York, it's obvious, isn't it? And then things that are perhaps slightly accidental and some of them are really purposeful. So top left, I think, is a gable wall in Dalston and it's... I don't know if it's accidentally beautiful or whether it's deliberately painterly. Um, the third one across is a really strange gable wall of, I'm assuming, kind of chimneys that's been exposed by, I don't know, bomb damage or something that's never been repaired. That's in Aldgate and oh, other fragments of Portugal, obvious bits of London, bits by the coast. And we try and share that. When we set up a website, we thought, they're really dull, they just end up being monographs, which is partly why I'm trying to talk less about projects and more about process, I suppose. Uh, so website's got our projects on it. But it's also got a thing that we've, that we've been doing for about 
eight years, pre-Instagram, just like to say, um, of all the things that we've made and all the things that we've found. So we like the idea that we could put something up each week and to actually visit a website where it does change would actually be a lot more fun. Obviously, being social now is the only thing. Um, but at the time, it felt like we were being interesting. And now we've faded into dullness. And the other part of our process, we are obsessive hand drawers. And I think, I think if you draw a line in CAD, when you click go, you know where the end is. And I think that's a kind of really crucial thing. You start drawing a line in CAD, you, you've predicted the end before you've actually put the start in. Whereas a kind of a line drawn by hand is much more exploratory and you can kind of easily change direction, much more easily change direction when you're halfway along that line or you just give up. But you can't do that in CAD. It doesn't have this kind of flexibility. And these are, um, it's a house in Oregon, which should be on site later in the year. Another strange random connection. Uh, the client said, I want a really big gable. I want a, a big barn. So we gave them a really big barn, um, slightly filtered through Louis Kahn. So we drew a lot of drawings and then we make models, always in house. We don't have anything which we would consider a presentation model, although sometimes I guess they do get, in some ways, a bit too precious. Um, so this is the less important bit to talk to you about some some projects. I, I've put this together kind of in the last couple of days, so I have no idea whether it's 20 minutes long or four hours. So um, when the lights go out, I'll know that I need to go and catch a train. So this, this was the, the garage site that I showed you. This was one of our, this was our first detached building, which was sort of exciting for us. So this was 2013, which sounds really recent, but feels like a very long while ago. So we were suddenly overcome with this kind of luxury of a building that had all of these elevations and that you could kind of look out of a house and see a garden on all sides. Everything up to that point had been unbelievably kind of constrained. Um, so we started off uh, with, a, with a series of four rooms around a hall, not dissimilar to a kind of very conventional house or a, a sort of classical house, a sort of Palladian plan, I suppose. But then we began to kind of distort and shift that. But we knew that, that from within the house, from every point, you wanted to be, we wanted to be able to see the garden. And then the thing to the right, perhaps what I should mention, is it looks, overlooks a park. And that kind of funny little squiggle shape is actually a stream. It sounds idyllic, um, but it's South London, so it's not that idyllic. And, it, and because it kind of sits behind everything, it doesn't have a relationship to the street. And I guess we'd, we'd done a couple of things which were difficult in fill houses, in conservation areas. So it was, it was, we were always within, we were unbelievably constrained. So we suddenly had this kind of slightly more loose fit house to play with. Um, immediately to the south, there were some houses that were quite close. So we then had these kind of um, the void spaces with the hatches for them to kind of bring light into that plan without actually looking at first floor across to the neighbours. And then we, we liked the idea that it was behind all of these houses, so it could be sort of informal and of itself. Um, and in a sense, it was like it was made of the offshoots of those houses, so those kind of raggedy bits that you get on the back of a house where somebody's clipped on the chimney 100 years ago because they wanted to change the use of that room. So that it, it's a building which is kind of formed of those offshoots. And then we liked the idea that actually... Um, a house, or certainly an elevation, can kind of be dis defined by something like a chimney. So this is a, a Voise, an arts and crafts house. And I guess also what was the kind of quite nice connection, much to everybody's annoyance, I always try and put a fireplace in a house. Um, in London, that's a DEFRA-approved log burner, obviously. Um, and I think the kind of actually within the interior, a hearth, a heart to the house is... It, unbelievably important um, and actually they have this kind of really nice domestic expression on the rear so and I, I suppose arts and crafts houses are kind of lots of people's image of the ideal comfortable home which is kind of rich with detail and, and materials and then that house was bought so it was for our accidental developer by quite a stylish couple um, and with that that unbelievably colorful wall we'd done it in this tasteful muted green and we were then told that it's like, well, I'm, I'm gonna, I've commissioned an artist to paint on that. And obviously we're control freaks, we're architects. There was this kind of horror that swept around the office. Um, but I suppose people are allowed to move into their houses and 
take ownership of them. Uh, and then we actually began to kind of think, well, it, it, we, this house has two fireplaces, so I really did get my way. So this one kind of sits in an ingle nook, and I, I think uh, our client had kind of picked up on the fact that there was this kind of niched fireplace that was, was like an ingle nook, and it's almost like they've sort of selected an oversized William Morris wallpaper. So we've kind of slowly grown to not quite love it, but um, it overlooks park. There you go. And it's almost like, I suppose, the park becomes the front to this house. And then from within the centre of the house, at every point, that's just as you go in the front door, you see straight through to the park. You can always see the garden. And then there's a sort of hierarchy to the living spaces. So there's, a, there, there's the small ingle nook living room. It's a three-bedroom house, and we always try and do two downstairs sitting rooms, if we've got the luxury of that, because then you've got a kind of easy fourth bedroom. Um, but because we're often on difficult backland and infill sites, planners don't also then look at you and think, well, this is a really greedy big house. It's four bedrooms plus three bar plus, you know, blah, blah, blah. So we tried to give hierarchy to those living spaces. So there's always a principal one. So we panelled this room. It's got a taller ceiling that you then look down to as you go up the stairs. Um, and that's kind of revealed in the exterior, this kind of slightly ad hocness and the kind of breaking and stepping in section and plan. And then uh, Steve, who'd already built one house, not satisfied with that, he thought he'd build another one. Only, I think only about four years later. So this is just finished a year, year and a half ago. It's got quite a lot of energy, damn him. Um, so this, I'm supposed to like read out a list, otherwise he'll tell me off. He was supposed to be here today, but he's gone to a boring meeting instead. Last minute, chaos and emergency. This won an RBA regional project, uh, a London small project, a national RBA award, and was shortlisted, longlisted for House of the Year. So we had the dubious pleasure of eight hours with Kevin McLeod and the film crew in his house. And it, it's quite a weird street. It's the same street where he built the first house, which is on the left, um, and behind that, grey wedge, as we affectionately refer to it. Um, there's a very conventional Victorian street, but this, the next building plot he bought is a kind of dilapidated kind of muse. Um, there is quite an ugly house, conveniently hidden behind that tree. So there are houses that are emerging, but I think the, the idea was that we'd do something with kind of real weight and presence that would begin to kind of collect up this slightly messy street and to make a kind of threshold and a frontage and something that was a bit more generous with a planter and kind of stepping up to the front door. Um, I, it's always slightly weird when you talk, this is kind of, a, it's a 3144 project, but it was obviously led by Steve, not, not me. And um, when one of your business partners is building a house, you don't want to kind of get too involved and meddle because they might end up not being your business partners or your friends. So um, Steve is very rigorous, so this plan is, was kind of refined and refined and refined over many, many hours. So it's a kind of um, very compact, very efficient little house. And I think the thing, it's quite hard to kind of see or describe in photographs, but I think the re kind of the remark, the thing that the RBA judges really liked it is the level of finish when you're in the house feels kind of slightly breathtaking. Um, he's got a very stylish wife, so everything is always immaculate and um, styled and curated. So it, it, it's, it's a very pleasant experience being, being in, in that house. And to be fair, a lot of it was hand-finished. So there are photographs of Steve's wife sitting on the stairs of that for three weekends, just kind of sanding and sanding and sanding and then oiling and oiling to get this sort of slightly, um, the sort of perfect pinky beige that she was looking for. And it's, um, she's a collector. So I don't know what all of those actually do. <laughs> don't think about some of them. But yeah, it's the most Instagrammed utility room, I think. And then from my favorite fire alarm to my favorite toilet door. Um, shouldn't have had that third coffee. Uh, this is a toilet door in, in Rome, um, in a church. And uh, I'm about to talk about Red House. And I, I suppose what I really like about this door is that there's a, there's a kind of deliberate act of continuity that they were kind of in denial about the fact that they might need a door there. And actually when you're there, bits of it in marble and then bits of it are in kind of 
timber that's painted up to kind of match marble. And I like this idea that you set off with a kind of a clear intent to continue the idea of something, but then you perhaps might subvert it. So this project um, was for our architectural patron, and I'll get round to why in a couple of slides' time. Um, we, it's, it's a very, very conventional street. So there are kind of about 40 houses that match, and they're all very kind of well looked after and immaculately, immaculately kept. And they're kind of these arched doorways kind of bounce and bounce and bounce along the street. And there's a kind of a level of, I suppose, sort of slightly fruity Victorian detail. And we were interested in the house that could be kind of um, a bit harder or tougher than that, but would still have a kind of equivalence in the detail, that it wasn't deliberately, deliberately blunt. So we got the idea that we were going to continue the arch, um, but we were going to kind of deny that to, from being the front door, so it's blocked by a planter. Um, and then behind that space, it's a kind of window into a, actually sort of two and a half height space. And then if we're going to make an arch, then it shouldn't be something that was without kind of rigour, I suppose. So we thought, well, we'll make it out of concrete. And then as soon as an architect thinks of concrete, you, you have this kind of idea, well, let's actually expose that concrete to show that the arch is load-bearing. Let's kind of start to reveal the depth of this, this kind of concrete, concrete panel. So we were, yeah, very intent that any of those kind of what seemed like, might seem like a slightly, slight piece of frippery would actually be fairly rigorous. It's a ridiculously constrained site. Our client, the patron, uh, bought it and it was about to be refused with a 97 square metre house. And he set a very careful brief um, and we kind of massaged the form of it on site. And I think it's actually about 135 square metres. So that we built completely to the site edges and we started, to, we started off almost by saying, well, what would happen in a Victorian house? Because this is a narrow-fronted house, and that's a pretty good typology that's been kind of refined over a long period of time, the, the London Terrace or the British Terrace. Um, but then we wanted to get light into the middle of the plan. We knew that we were going to probably have to drop a half level to then try and squeeze three s stories into the space of two. Um, so it has this kind of light well, and we started to kind of just push the, the rooms um, so the rooms above are quite conventional and the ground floor is a little bit more wild, but it's only in response to the, the form of the site. And I think what we were always trying to do is we had a kind of inherited strange geometry, but we were always quite keen that the rooms didn't suffer because of that geometry, that you could always kind of find a, a straightforward way of, of using that room. So you come in and then there's a kind of double height, two and a half height, kind of hall space and then you drop down into the main living area. Um, a bit of process. We, this is quite old now, so it kind of seems a bit clunky, but we always make a digital 3D model as well as a physical 3D model because they reveal completely different things. Um, but you can see how squeezed in it is and the fact that we really couldn't have any aspect so the, this view, the view on the left, I'm kind with, you're sort of sitting where the sun is. Um, so we, could, we were kind of really constrained about having windows there because they'll be looking straight into the rear gardens of those houses and apartments to the left. At the rear, there was a, there's a little balcony. Um, and so the, the chimney, uh, yes, we've got chimney in again. Um, that actually acts as a privacy screen. So the windows in the bedroom are tight to the chimney and there's a point where you just move past and then you just catch the edge of their balcony. So we try to use something, it has a kind of practical reason as, re as well as something which is, is kind of very architectural. It finishes this kind of long terrace with this kind of quite big chimney stack. Yeah, I've told you now, we do lots of drawing, everything all at once, so kind of plans, elevations, sections, details. And it was a long day, so it turned into a Venetian palazzo at one, one point. And we had, so we'd had this idea of a kind of concrete panel um, and we looked around in the street for an idea about pattern. So we took, because it's a, it's a threshold to the house, it is its kind of uh, declaration to the street, it's the line between public and private, uh, we took a Victorian tiling pattern. So we sort of took photographs of tiled pathways and tiled hallways and then we tested those. This was a laser, laser cut model and then we selected the one on the left. 
And then um, this was the act of great patronage, I feel. Uh, our client really bought into the idea of this, so that we had a silicon mould made by Cambridge Architectural Precast. They were very kind to us. Other concrete firms are available, but um, I would highly recommend them. And then they lifted, up, lifted it up in, in one piece. So to make it and install it was £14,000, which I don't know whether that's obscene or not. If, I, if it wasn't there, then we'd need £2,000 worth of brickwork, I suppose, with labour. But it was, it, there was this moment where I thought, wow, that's, that's like our kind of client buying a Volkswagen Golf and kind of pinning it to the front of the building. It's, it's, it is an extra. And there was an anecdote that Portcullis House, where all of our beloved MPs sit, they could have done the same clad, they could have covered the building in seven series BMWs or something, rather than the bronze that Michael and Patty Hopkins selected. So this is the detail. So we, um, which, which what I quite like is that some of that detail is only revealed when you get close to it. So it has a bit of the background about it, but when you get close to it, it is definitely, I suppose, not a background building. Um, we didn't call it Red House. I should probably um, sign a disclaimer, but uh, because uh, there are obviously a couple of very, very famous houses, the Red House um, uh, in, in Bexley. And then Tony Fretton also did a house that he called The Red House for one of the Sainsbury's, which is rather grand and rather lovely. Uh, it was named by the neighbours um, because our client overheard them going that <coughs> red house. So it became a kind of nickname for it because I don't think they were actually that in love with the brick. Even though the next street along was this pure, punchy kind of red blick, brick. And we really liked the idea that we took the highlight brick out of the neighbours and made it this kind of end of terrace kind of bookend. But... Yeah, it didn't, we didn't name it, and they named it in, in rage. Um, so this is this kind of light well, which if the sun was out, it just glows quite overpoweringly red, but our clients seem to really like it. And then, of course, there's a fireplace. What used to be on the site was a workshop, so we liked the idea that the fire felt like a kind of really quite a rough thing, like a relic of, of what had gone before. And it, the interior and exterior, because the exterior spaces are very small, are sort of deliberately blurry. So that when all the doors are open, it, feel that it feels like a kind of extended living space. I'll speed up. And that's, that's the chimney stack, which kind of acts as a privacy screen as well as a kind of architectural marker to the end of the long terrace. In the lower ground, there's this sense that you're uh, just through a kind of bit of panelling, that you're actually, you are beneath the level. And I think there's quite a nice kind of threshold that you drop down and it feels like you're going into this kind of very... Um, enclosed, comforting house. And the curve of the arch is reflected in some of the details up through the house. Off the back of that house, we got another house, um, because I guess Red House is slightly eccentric. We got two artists in South London came to us really excitedly and said, we, your brief is to make our house as madly, as madly eccentric as you can. Um, so we're still generating this, but it, it's in a conservation area again. And so we're just kind of pulling big fragments out of some of the neighbouring buildings, which are very nice, and kind of making this kind of house, which is composed of its neighbouring fragments. Uh, this is a house in Amsterdam. So this is for James. Both of my business partners have self-built now. <sighs> Pressure's on. Um, so James was, you know, cycling for a coffee and apple cake like you do in Amsterdam most days um, and stumbled across this little cottage for sale, which was half falling down, so nobody wanted to buy it. It had a series of constraints that um, they, they, it's quite strict, the planning there. They sort of define what you might be able to build before you actually put in an application. So we knew the kind of form of, and uh, that it had to be set back from the street slightly before we even got started. And that is kind of Amsterdam, the, the kind of the idea of individual expression um, in pleasing biscuit form. So this is the house. So again, we wanted something that was perhaps slightly sombre, or quite quiet in what's actually quite the kind of busy street. The setback was imposed, but then we thought, well, there's an opportunity to actually make it slightly generous to the street. Um, and what's now happened, which is really nice, James has a young family, lots of people in the street kind of gather, and in that incredibly Dutch way, they all sort of drink wine in the road on kind of Saturday evenings, and it's, it, has a, it's, it has a really nice sociability about it. 
well, as a city, but as, as a house. And there are lots of precedents on those kind of grand canals where you go up staircases and then there's a bench seat by the door where you kind of, I suppose, take your boots off and head into your house. Uh, very tight, narrow plots, as you might imagine. And then um, we really kind of worked on this idea about threshold. So um, it's, it's very abrupt to the street, and that's really noticeable, I think, when you go as a kind of uh, conservative British type and you sort of see all these living rooms with their curtains open right at the back of pavement. And we kind of like the idea that we'd kind of create depth within the house. So there's a light well, because it's a, it's a deep house, but that kind of almost feels like an outdoor space because you suddenly get this uh, shaft of light from above. And then to drop down into the kitchen so that those steps feel like another kind of, another threshold. Um, and this is uh, a convenience that I only discovered about a week ago, which I really... So this is one of the De Hoke paintings that we got our students to turn into models. Um, but conveniently, there's a child on the step, there's a few people sitting around a table, there's a view of a distant door, um, and it, it sort of has that kind of quality of a, a Dutch painting. And it also kind of re works in reverse too, so the kind of timber ceiling in the painting and in, in, the, in the house. And then this kind of view into the, the top lit hall, which almost feels like the kind of courtyard of, of the painting on the left. And then the sense of a street beyond and, an, and another room. And um, yeah, lucky few. It's quite nice, that, isn't it? We've got a nice sitting room. Um, and then our accidental <coughs> developer came back to us with another garage site, which really did feel slightly placeless. I suppose we're, we were so used to working with context and difficult neighbours um, that we suddenly had this kind of sense of kind of nowhere. Everything around it, without being too rude, was incredibly normal, um, a bit bland, and we wanted to kind of make something of character. Uh, we worked a lot with thinking about what the existing kind of built pattern was and how our houses could kind of continue that and slot into it. We were very, very careful with first floor windows again because you end up being quite close to your neighbours. So I think backland sites are difficult because you obviously, you're not just building next to somebody or between somebody. They're not expecting a house at the bottom of their garden. So you really have to kind of manage the, the kind of imposition that, that makes on existing communities when you're an architect. Uh, so we introduced lots of courtyards and kind of... Um, kind of almost outdoor halls that dropped through, through the volume of the house to kind of bring light into them and to allow first floor windows into these outdoor halls because we couldn't necessarily always have first floor windows looking back at houses and their kind of cherished garden amenity spaces. And we started to think about how we would make the sense of a place. Um, we'd just taken our students to Rome and kind of there's this ridiculous sense of what has gone before in Rome. There's a kind of place there now, but there's this sense of previous places that have existed. So we sort of like the idea that maybe these houses would have a kind of fragment of something within them that would almost feel like it had pre-existed, that we're actually building on the idea of a place rather than just something completely new. Surprise, surprise, we did lots of hand drawings again. Have I drummed home how much we love hand drawings and how important it is for you not to stick in CAD? Uh, so this idea of this kind of outdoor hall at uh, the bottom right, and that a sense of materials being kind of laid upon each other. And it also had a kind of this sort of practical thing that we could have first floor windows into it, not looking at our neighbours, but also you had to walk in past the houses, and the muse that they kind of cluster around is quite tight. So you could kind of create privacy. Um, so that's one of those external hall spaces. And then from the interior, you can, have, you can then actually have large windows into that kind of protected, protected hall. And I think um, we've, I think that, that very first house that I showed you when I was trying to kind of wean myself off being employed by somebody else for 10 years, um, and you're kind of refinding what you're interested in, I was always been slightly obsessed by the case study housing programme and that kind of period in America where everything seemed so kind of easy and lovely and all of these lifestyles were kind of writ large in the architecture that they had this incredible kind of internal, external um, kind of existence. 
have got great weather, of course. Um, and actually, also, they have a kind of really direct structural tectonic, so you can see how they're made. So we, that's always been something that's sort of hanging in the background. That's two more of the houses that are clustered in the corner, so we kind of push and pull the idea of this external hall to create privacy. Um, it's just gone to tender, uh, and we wanted to make sure that the interior, when you do a set of planning drawings, they're remarkably diagrammatic, really, at 1 to 100. And that's all you're really obliged to do. So we wanted to kind of make sure that there was a sense of things being placed upon, upon you from the inside out as well. So um, we had one incredibly diligent part one working on one of the houses uh, because they all share lots of details for quite quite a large amount of time, but to kind of build it from the inside out, to kind of think about the setting out of ceiling joists against the setting out of the kitchen cabinets and, yeah, everything all at once. It's quite intense. And this one we got a fireplace indoors and out, so win-win. Um, so we, we started to think of these kind of loose spaces at ground floor. We decided we kind of started to make the joinery in the model so that the kind of character of them was really defined. And then we sort of built, kind of built our way back out of the house. So hopefully they will be on site in the summer. And that um, accidental developer then came to us with another site. Um, so we, we sort of, again, it was a kind of quite a difficult backland spot. So we, we sort of worked with this idea about, well, maybe we kind of push on this idea of working with a fragment of something. And in fairness, he came to us and said, I'm going to sell this. So get me consent for two houses and I'll, I'll sell this on. Um, so we knew it was a slightly theoretical exercise. So we, we didn't have, I suppose, quite the same financial responsibility that we had had to him in the past, where we knew we couldn't be wild and mad. Um, that was the plan of a house. So, Villa Rotonda by Palladio. So the idea of this kind of internal fragment, the, the very first detached house that I talked about had a kind of uh, a double height hall in the middle with four key rooms that we pushed and, and shuffled around to kind of work with the site and to kind of give the spaces hierarchy. Um, we, we kind of again started in a similar position and we made a, a sort of fragment, the idea that, that the hallway in the, in the Palladian Villa would be an internal space we made that an external courtyard, and then with this kind of deep niched fragment around it, which would contain the stairs in a similar way that the, the, the Palladio's villas often do, um, and practical things like cupboards and seats and you know plant and bits of kitchen. And then we, I mean, this was obviously the refined version of that. We then you know kind of buried that fragment in a house, but because of the site it doesn't get completely wrapped around. So you kind of have to walk past one house to get in the other. But in the middle there, it's perhaps easiest on the right-hand house, you can see that kind of contained fragment. And then the <coughs> upper floor. And then uh, the same model maker, sadly she's now gone back to do her masters, but the most immaculate model maker we've ever had. Um, she's coming back. Uh, you can kind of read, read that fragment embedded in the elevation, so the kind of it sort of pushes out, and then you move into the hall. This is a 1 to 20 model. Um, and you start moving around it, you reach the kitchen, and you look back, and on the right-hand side is the courtyard. You look into the kitchen, um, and because people are walking past you, we wanted kind of light from above and not, not overly large windows. And then there's a point where you look back across that courtyard, and there's a sort of niched seat opposite you. I think that, that project, this project, is probably the one that I regret most that we will not get to build, partly because it's particularly, I guess it, it feels laden down with the personality of what we're trying to do as a practice. And then very quickly, um, three houses that we did in the last nine months or so, uh, this was on the edge of a kind of raggedy muse that you can see on the left, and it was in a, in a very conventional street again, but we, because of the, the shape of the site, um, we thought it's, it's going to look really weird if we try and kind of put a conventional house in here. So we decided to kind of take up the language of, of what the muse might be formed of, that it could be a, a house that might look like a re-inhabited workshop. So it has a sort of industrial um, 
aesthetic. You get that kind of thing sometimes, don't you, on the sides of blocks when you get deep blocks and you get people that have turned their garage into a kind of small local industry, a builder's yard or a car workshop. So it was it's kind of founded on that sort of slightly background building, which, of course, we made a model of. Um, and then this one, actually for the same clients, uh, was in a very, well, quite an interesting street, but a really normal London suburb of sort of sub arts and crafts houses, that sort of interwar stuff that we're all very familiar with, on the crank in a street. So we, we tried to kind of generate a house from these big fragments um, of its neighbours. And then within the plan, in the centre of the house, there is it's a fireplace, um, shock horror, and it, it, it's the staircase and everything. So it is like this kind of um, totem in the middle of the house. Again, I, I suppose playing with that idea of a, the kind of key components of an arts and crafts house. This one's even harder to spot. Um, so it's a kind of end of terrace in a conservation area, although bits of it you'd probably struggle to tell. Uh, so we wanted to make something that was uh, initially very quiet, I suppose. Um, but whereas all the other houses have kind of steps up to their front doors, we kind of knew that our house needed to have a ground floor entrance so that the kind of the memory of the steps becomes a canopy to the front door. Um, and then just this kind of sense of uh, the kind of Georgian, late Georgian, early Victorian kind of neighbours. And it's right onto the back of pavement, which um, I'm, I suppose I'm slightly surprised that we actually did manage to get away with because none of the other streets have that. There's a pub that this looks across to opposite, um, which is set well back, but it has this kind of character. And it's kind of self-explanatory. And then this, these, the, just very quickly, um, these are the kind of more urban projects that we're doing and the, I suppose the bigger side of things. So this is the first one that we did for the New York spreadsheet guy. So this had a different set of demands. One of his friends was CEO of J. Crew, So he'd already signed a deal to get J. Crew a shop on Redchurch Street and he'd given them a handover date um, before he'd completed on the building, before he realised how you get planning for something in a conservation area or how you might buy that building, put two floors on top of it and put a basement beneath it, um, whilst promising all press coffee that they'd never have to move out. And that did actually happen. Uh, and we went from planning consent to handover in nine months. So as soon as it went in for planning, we started doing working drawings. We signed up a contractor. Um, we started digging quite large trial pits, um, sort of like a basement, but they, in fairness, I mean the contractor, they were commissioned to do trial pits, they started digging and obviously they have to kind of reduce a certain level, they propped all the floor above, they uh, pushed up a slab beneath it, um, and then they had to kind of excavate around the edges in three or four different locations uh, to actually establish what the structure would be, so it was, it was a kind of, it was a half excavated basement under the guise of a trial pit but it was in all fairness a safe trial pit so you just couldn't get under the building and um, the render on the right I guess that's the the idea that we try and do things of um, the kind of when I was talking to you about the student work about the depth of a city we were interested in the distant figure of this building um, we were fortunate I think that obviously the conservation officer was not too in love with it the street further down is is quite Georgian and quite fine um, so they were pleased that we would actually be kind of reappropriating this existing building. So we kept all of the brick piers and the concrete frame. We took out the windows because it was going from a, what was it used to be a factory into a, well, initially an apartment, you know, a kind of domestic room, a domestic window, and actually it ended up, it's now a hotel, a small hotel. Um, so we made models which would kind of look at the, the kind of the profile of it from a distance and then the kind of subtle things about just moving back when we were recladding it, a cladding panel by 50 mil. We were, we knew that we'd have to kind of extend those brick piers so we then had to paint it and so I mean there, there were lots of kind of practical decisions, it wasn't just uh, black for fashion's sake and 50 shades of grey. So that 
that's the finished thing. And what we were trying to do on the photograph that I showed you earlier was kind of to draw out the character of that Victorian warehouse. And as it turns the corner, the cladding panels that you can kind of see on there are all are then set flush, much like the kind of Georgian buildings that are further down the street. So it has a kind of um, subtlety in the setting out of the depth of the facade. And uh, we, used a, we used a material called jesmonite. Um, because it's much lighter than concrete, but we wanted to make a building which looked kind of heavy. Uh, but it's amazing, the, though, the, when you look at those panels, they look dead flat, and then the sun does that, and you realise that within a kind of construction tolerance, there's kind of great, they're sort of billowing, but I mean, it's just the very particular time that we took the photo. That building is the slightly pinky one there, so our client, very obligingly then bought next door um, which goes completely through the block so it goes from the sort of smarter red church street to uh, quite a, a scruffy muse um, on the back street but it's a scruffy muse which has a, a very nice David Ajay house on it it has the back of what was Rachel Whiteread's house so it's it's a pretty cool muse um, and such is the way now. We're obviously trying to achieve an awful lot on a small site, so we have a, a two-storey basement. Uh, the ground, the sub-basement is basically full of plant, uh, a huge water tank for the sprinkler system. So our client bought this to turn it into a hotel. So in that intervening period, he'd got to be friends with Nick Jones of Soho House Group. Um, so he'd kind of already decided Whereas the previous project next door, we started off making an apartment building and ended up making a hotel. This we knew was a hotel, and it connects through to that, that other building. Um, we, I said that we do lots of hand drawing. I thought I'd put this in because we test things in computer as well. So the kind of, that's the evolution of the rear facade onto this kind of industrial muse. So we like the idea that it might have something which was born out of the language of a kind of... Um, there's lots of warehouses near here that have kind of a, a brick opening with a stone lintel and a cast iron column in them. And the idea that the kind of the free column is actually slightly more, more evocative of an industrial building. So that's sort of where it went. And then the, the street, Red Church Street, we'd already said I mean, next door that it had to be this kind of flat facade at a certain level because it kind of drew along the Georgian character of the street. So we'd sort of set those constraints up on ourselves but then we wanted it to somehow represent the rear street which was kind of 80 meters back in the block um, so we kind of brought back this kind of idea of a kind of columned facade a columned attic it's just kind of yet more testing and that's now currently on site so we we dug a very deep hole and now we're slowly filling it up and um, being perilously careful with party wars and many, many neighbours. Joy. And then I'm going to stop uh, before you all drift off, or I do. Uh, this is our kind of latest project, uh, which again is for the, the same American client, so it's, a, it's quite a shift in scale for us. So it will be a fairly large hotel of about 100 rooms. Um, if if our client gets his way, there's a rooftop pool, there's a gym, there's a spa, there's a goodness knows what, and it all attaches to rather precious, rather amazing listed building. So it's, that's kind of currently where we are. So I'm going to go back to the grumpy old man. Maybe that's what we will eventually turn up into. Um, so the idea that, I think when I put this up, I said, that, you know, we don't picture ourselves looking back at a city that we have half made like Mises here, but I, I, I hope we're able to look back at small pieces of a city and think we have enriched the life of that city, we didn't get that one completely wrong, that one perhaps we should have done this differently, but to kind of look back positively in oh, it's 10 years time when we retire, 30 years time, um, I hope there'll be something there that we actually feel that we, um, we did a, a responsible act and a dignified civic kind of job to contributing to a whole series of cities and places. Thank you. <laughs>